great to see you. And uh, if you notice, we've got new panels in. So if I don't sound like Sean Connery to you, then they're not working properly. So when you hear my voice, it should sound like Sean Connery. So does it sound like Sean Connery? No. <laughs> Rab Zee Nesbitt, closer. <laughs> well, folks, it's great to see you. And uh, we've come together to, to worship the Lord together. And we had the gift day last week. And so before we do any other announcements, uh, I, I want to ask David to come and tell us how we did uh, last uh, Sunday. It's hard to walk up here with a sad face. Uh, incredibly, we've paid off the remaining £25,000 of the £175,000 bank loan. It's paid off. So, I mean, the final contract price has been agreed, but we're actually still waiting on the bill coming in. We've been chasing our solicitor for a long, long time about his bill. In 11 years, we haven't paid our solicitor anything other than the restrictive covenants. That's nothing else. We've been chasing him. He's to send in his bill. We've got the sign panels put in, and we can pay for those. We haven't got the bill for that yet. But we still have enough money in the Red Sky account to pay all of these bills. Last week's gift service was incredible. Isn't hindsight an incredible quality, but, you know, if you sit where we are this morning and look back after, over the 11 years, 11 years, we can see all the problems we faced. We can see people's enormous generosity, including the gift of not just one house, but two houses. Huge financial support from Central Church, huge financial contributions from individuals, as well as all of the fundraising that's been done over the 11 years. We can see so, so many people all doing their part. And we can see huge savings on the TAL contract itself, which then incredibly reduced the architect's design fees. And all of that practically eliminated the bank charges, which would have been huge. We had, of course, planned to sell off some of the land way back uh, before 2008 for £290,000. But after the credit crunch in 2008, the land wasn't worth anything at all. So we held on to it. And then we got it tarmacked, and it's now a full car parking area. So we have a nice new building, and incredibly, it's all paid for. And really, a huge, huge thanks to everyone who has played their part in this. And the challenge ahead of us is simple. We have to use these premises as best we can in serving God in Sydenham and allow him to build a church of people who are really living in him and a church which is growing. That's the challenge. But thank you, everybody. Fantastic. So, Martin, can I ask you to say a few words? David gets to do all the good bits, doesn't he, you know? So, what happens now? What do we do with our, our pink envelopes? Well, <laughs> straightforward. The simple fact is we would love you to continue to contribute to the general funds of the church simply by transferring what you've put into your pink envelopes into the blue envelopes. Or you can split it up using the white envelopes as well to the other areas of the church. As David said, since we've been opened in this building. We've done lots of great things here in this community. We've made this building um, a building for the community and we've made it a church for the community. And each one of us have been witnesses for God through all the groups that we that have met that meet each week. And God continues to bless those groups. Just this week I was at the Methodist annual conference. Um, I was asked to go there on behalf of PCI just to observe and to see what they get up to. One of the new initiatives that they are introducing through all the congregations is a thing called Warm Hearts, Tough Hands, Wet Feet. Warm Hearts means a love for the gospel, a love for what it teaches about Jesus, and a love for what it teaches about mission. We read in Acts chapter 1, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
Tough hands means active mission. Serving the neighborhood through social action, courageous evangelism, teaching, worship, and pastoral care. And wet feet. Well, you've heard that expression before. Really, it means it's when someone tries something for the first time, they get their feet wet. And so the Methodist Church wants to equip its people with good biblical knowledge and perspective, and that, uh, that and the ability to bring their faith in Jesus to others through normal discussion and chats and discourse. And so they introduced this subject and we broke into groups for a few minutes for a brief discussion. And I had to be honest with them, with the people that were in my wee group. And I said, look, see in Strand, we're ahead of the game. We've been doing this for a long time already. For years, we've had ministers preaching faithfully and teaching us a love for the gospel. If you look at any of our activities, each one of those activities fits into both, fits into both tough hands for the things that we're already doing, and each one of you has already experienced that wet feet sort of expression. Last week, Danny spoke to us about the grace of giving, about the Macedonian church and the fact that their love for God, giving themselves to him, also extended to their generosity of giving financially to the work of the church. Everyone in this church, as David has already said, has given so much to the Red Sky Project over the past 11 years. And so all I want to do is encourage you um, to be like the Macedonian church, as Paul did with the Corinthians, to excel in your grace of giving to the church. Thank you. Lots of different times in your life, uh, you have mountaintop experiences, you have times when you think, isn't God good? And last week, last Sunday night, was one of those experiences when we realized because of your sacrifice, because of your generosity, we're able to pay off uh, Red Sky completely. So again, I want to, on behalf of Kirk Session, I want to thank you so much. I am delighted to be the minister of this church. I, I speak about you often because of your generosity, of your sacrifice, but mainly because of your faith, faith in a God who is great. And so we really do want to thank you for all that you've done uh, in the Lord's name. Uh, for his people in this place. A couple other announcements. I want to remind you of the evening service tonight. Uh, it's at seven o'clock. Uh, it'd be great to see you. Stephen is preaching tonight, and so it'd be good to see you out again. I want to remind you of the church picnic this afternoon. Uh, we're asked to meet at Crawfordsburn Park at half past 12. I've been given directions. I don't know Crawfordsburn Park really well, but Harry says halfway down the drive, way into Crawford, Crawfordsburn Park. There's an open area on the left. That is hopefully where we will be. So if you know Crawfordsburn Park, you've probably understood what I've just said. And that's good, that's good. So those who can go, it'd be good to see you. Uh, and it's a lovely day. Backpacking went on well yesterday and they raised over 285 pounds. Want to thank those who were involved in the backpacking. We, we really do appreciate that. I think that's all the announcements. Just to say that there's no announcement sheet today. The reason for that is uh, uh, it's come to an end of an era. Um, Edward has been doing this for many, many years, and uh, his computer has given up the ghost. And unfortunately, the, the software that Edward, Edward uses is not transferable. And so there'll be no, we, we don't normally do it in July and August anyway, but we will be looking for someone to replace Edward, a mini me or a mini Edward. <coughs> And, uh, and so if you would like to be involved and do the announcements each week, uh, would you come and see me uh, sometime between now and beginning of September? And if I come and see you and talk to you about something and then I change the subject, then you know what I'm going to change the subject to. So it's good to see you and thank you so much for coming here this morning. We've come together to worship the Lord and therefore we're going to be singing a song that we know ever so well. And it's all about what we've been doing this last wee while. And what we hope to do in the future is there is a hope, and that hope is found in Christ. Let's all stand as we worship.
I thought now and again we might do a children's address, and so I'm going to do one today, if that's okay. And I forgot to get a mic, so I'm going to do it from up front, but normally I'll come down. That was my fault. Okay, folks, what's that there? Coke. That's right. Is it is it good Coke or bad Coke? Bad Coke. Yeah, because you're right, because it's not Diet Coke, isn't that right? I think there's something about eight spoonfuls of sugar in that can of Coke. That's amazing, isn't it? Well, that's a can of Coke. And over this last wee while in church, we've been talking about what it means to be Christians, what it means to be the church. And we were saying that the church is is for people who have been transformed in the sense of what it is, is is recognizing who we are in Jesus, recognizing that Jesus changes our hearts so that we can become more like God. And I thought I would like to illustrate it because this is a can of Coke. What do you do normally when you drink the can of Coke? What do you do after you drink the can of Coke? What do you do with this here? Well done. You throw it in the recycling. You don't throw it in the normal bin. You throw it in recycling bin, isn't that right? Because that's the best place from it. But I want to show you what this can be transformed into. So keep your eyes on this. Can you see it? Can you see it? Okay, you remember what it looks like? Where do you see what can be transformed? That's the shape of you. Ready? Where do you see this? I should have a drum music. Have you got drums with you, Stephen? No. <laughs> Ta-da. What do you think of that, eh? A camera. An old tin of Coke can be transformed into a camera. You can see it's still a tin of Coke, but it's been transformed into something really, really useful. A camera. Isn't that amazing? You would hardly believe that an old can of Coke and go round my neck. Look, look at that there. See that? I can also take photographs. Will I take a photograph? Will I take a photograph of Dexter? Yeah. yeah. Right, Dexter, come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Can you stand there for me, Dexter? Come on up the stairs. I'll take your photograph. You don't want the photo? Yeah, you come on up. No. I don't want well, to take a photograph of, of Martin. Yes. Renny, will I take your photograph? No. Right, Martin, come on up. Because this is an instant camera. An instant camera, you take a photograph and the, and the photograph comes out. You ready? Can you smile for me? Okay. <laughs> Just one. Whoa! Oh, look! That's Martin! That's Martin! Does it look like Martin? Doesn't it? That's just like Martin. Isn't that amazing how a can of coke, if it's transformed with someone who's very, very skillful, can make it into a camera that takes funny pictures? And that reminds me that God. Because sometimes we think that our life isn't worth much. We think that really nobody knows us and nobody thinks we're important. But God thinks you're very, very important. And God thinks that he can take you and he knows he can take you. And he can transform you and do something wonderful. Because you would hardly believe that a can of Coke can be transformed into a camera. And yet there you are, it has been, by someone who's skillful. God tells us he can transform into us into things that are absolutely wonderful. Because whenever you become a Christian, when you ask Jesus to be your friend and your saviour, he tells us that you become his child and you're transformed into something that is absolutely wonderful. Come on, we'll pray together. Let's close our eyes and we'll pray to God. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're a wonderful God and you can do all things. And you tell us that if we come and ask you to be our friend and our saviour, then you transform us. Now, we don't really understand exactly how that works. But Lord, we we have some sort of idea of, of you making us something even better than what we were before. And you do that because we become your children, we become your friend, and you live within us. And you help us to live lives that honour you. Help each one of us to understand what that means for us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, if you want to go now, it's been good to see you. Got my wee Hessian bag. <laughs> That's Lorraine's, I promise.
We're going to sing again. It's focusing on, we'll be focusing on Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us. And so therefore our next hymn is King of Kings, Majesty. Let's stand as we worship God together. We continue our study of John as we read John chapter 1. We read verses 4 to 51. It will come up in the screen. This is, is God's word. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said... He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and who is in closest relationship with the Father. He has made him known. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. 
I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Amen. Amen. Let's all pray. Father, we want to come before you and we want to say thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We want to say thank you for being with us as you've led and you've guided over these last number of years as we have moved forward in the vision that we believe that you gave to us. A vision to knock down our beautiful old building, to build something that maybe wasn't as beautiful, but would be far more practical in reaching out to this community who is lost. We thank you, Lord, that at each step of the way, you blessed us, you strengthened us, you reminded us of the vision that you gave to us and you gave us the faith. And now, Lord, as we sit here on the 14th of June, 2014, we want to say thank you for your goodness. As all the money is now paid towards the building, we recognize that that is not the, be the end, but it's only the beginning. Lord, as we thought last week, it's just like the people of Israel crossing the River Jordan. As they crossed the River Jordan, that wasn't the end of the story. That wasn't the fact that they had now arrived and that was it. It was all over. No. That's when the adventure really began. And so, Lord, we've been on a journey, a twisty, difficult journey at times. A journey when we, we felt full of hope and there was other times we were full of despair. At times our faith was strong and other times we have to confess our faith wasn't as strong as it should have been. But now we've crossed the Jordan. 
Now we have the building complete. And the building's complete, not so that we might sit down now and enjoy it, but so that it may be used by you and, and as, through us as, as a tool to reach others, that they too might find there is a hope, that they might be able to sing King of Kings and Majesty, that they'll be able to, to look and say, yes, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world that they too might be like Philip when Jesus said, follow me, and Jesus, Jesus, Philip followed. Lord, we pray that as this journey progresses, that we will be with you each step of the way, that we will be people who are constantly listening to what we should be doing, and we will be faithful and obedient as we do it. So continue to lead us and guide us. We thank you for how you've been with us, and we are confident today that you'll be with us in the future. And at times when our faith is weak, strengthen us. At times when our vision is short-sighted, help us to see the longer vision, the vision that you have given us, a vision where we see men and women and boys and girls from Sydney and beyond coming to faith and living and, and, and thriving in, a, in a, an exciting fellowship called your church. Help us to go forward in your name, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we come to consider uh, this passage, a really exciting passage, uh, we're going to sing again. It's from heaven you came, help this babe. Let's stand as we worship.
I think I'm the only one in the church today has experienced something uh, that was absolutely wonderful, uh, and yet I think everybody else in the church here takes it for granted. It was way back in December uh, 1980. I can still remember very, very clearly. And that was my first glimpse of Stormont. When I saw Stormont, I thought, now that is a building and a half. I thought, isn't that a beautiful building? And you've got Stormont, and you've got the lovely green uh, driveway on the other side of the driveway. You've got the lovely monument of, of was that Paisley waving? Or maybe it was Carson? That was a wee joke. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the big gates at the front. And I thought, now that's what you call a parliament building. Uh, a few years before that, when I was 16, uh, I went down with the church to London. And I remember standing outside Buckingham Palace thinking, is that it? It just looks like a big block of flats. And, uh, and I was really disappointed. The most exciting thing about Buckingham Palace was actually Queen Victoria on the outside. I thought actually she was far more impressive than the building itself. But Stormont, beautiful. And yet none of you agree with me. And the reason for that is you've grown up with it. From you were no age, you were going past Stormont. And some people live across from Stormont. Stephen's very posh. He sees it every day. And, uh, and so therefore you take it for granted. And if you work there, like Leslie, she detests it. But that's, that's never mind. I'm sure you don't. But, you know, you take it for granted because you see it and you've seen it from a small child and it just looks like Stormont. There's nothing fancy about it. But as an outsider coming when I was 20, when I saw it, I thought, wow, that was it. Uh, we had nothing like that in Glasgow. We have lovely, beautiful buildings. But the problem with the beautiful buildings in Glasgow is they're all together, actually. So you've lost a different beautiful buildings together. And London's a wee bit like that. You know, you've got one good site after another. And therefore, when you see Brigham Palace, you think, that's all right, nothing great. But a storm is there on its own with, with the, the, the great area all around it and the super driveway up. It looks magnificent. All you need now is a parliament to go in it. And, and once we've got that, we'll be doing well. Better not say that. And, uh, but honestly, beautiful. And yet, when, you, when you're living here, you don't really see it. And so we've been like this passage that, that we've read. This passage all revolves around one verse. Uh, and it's verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. That is a wonderful verse. And, and the next number of verses up to verse 51 is really just reaction to that. A reaction to that as far as John the Baptist is concerned. John says, I'm here to point to the one who is wonderful. I'm here to point to the one whose sandals I can't even untie because he is so more majestic. Because he's more majestic than me is because he was before me. And when he sees Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, John the Baptist is repeating really what this verse is saying. This is probably one of the most exciting verses in the Bible. And yet, because we know it really well, we tend to take it for granted. A wee bit like taking Stormont for granted. But John the Baptist doesn't. Because when he sees Jesus, he recognizes Jesus for who he really is. And he gives him praise and honor. And, and he's amazed that the others can't see it. And then Philip, one of the disciples, he sees it because he was with John and he hears what John says. And not only does he hear what John says, he believes what John says. And so when he actually comes in contact with Jesus and Jesus says, come follow me, the Bible just says very, very simply that Philip followed. It was obvious that Philip couldn't do anything else. When he came face to face with the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sin of the world, the only thing he could do is to follow him. Because he is the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And when Philip saw it, he followed. And then the final story in, 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 in this passage is Nathaniel. Nathaniel's minding his own business. He's sitting under a fig tree and just relaxing. And he hears about Jesus. And when he hears about Jesus, he hears a wee bit more information about him. This is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. That has the same tag to it as I was at a wedding last week down in Cavan. Very, very posh wedding. And, but it was in the middle of nowhere, two and a half hours away. The petrol that it cost me. I was really tempted to ask Lorraine to push me most of the way uh, just to save a bit of money, but she wasn't willing to do that because she had her dress on and, and she thought she would trip. And, uh, but we got there and the wedding was really nice. But while I was at the wedding, uh, the, the brother-in-law, the future brother-in-law was there and he was in this beautiful kilt and he looked the part. And I said to him, what part of Scotland are you from? I, I should have been a detective that I thought you might have been from Scotland. And he says, actually, I'm from, he mentioned this place just outside Glasgow that is really, really posh, very, very nice. And I said to him, that's a really nice part of, of Scotland. He says, yes, yes, I quite like living there. And so I said to him, well, I'm from Jump Chapel. Now, as soon as I said that, I had my clerical collar on, and uh, he said, sorry? And I said, I'm from John Chapel. He said, you're from John Chapel? I said, yes, fine. I could see him then making sure that his pockets in his watch. Was, <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I, said, I think I have to go and see somebody. And off he went. And uh, it, I get that reaction all the time. And the reason is because you folk don't really know Glasgow too well. And uh, John Chapel is really quite an exciting place to live. Uh, for lots of different reasons. And here he was, when he was talking, he, he sees a minister, and uh, the minister says he's from Drum Chapel. Uh, and, and the reaction was exactly how Nathaniel said it. Nazareth? Are, are you sure? Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But he's willing to go, and when he sees Jesus, and Jesus says, look, I saw you under the fig tree. It says, I believe. It says, well, listen, if you believe about that, wait till you see some of the things I'll be doing. And not only that, you're going to be able to see angels ascending and descending from heaven on the Son of Man. And so Nathaniel is someone who initially wants to dismiss who Jesus is, who, who has his preconceived ideas of the Messiah, of the Christ. So when he's told that this is the Christ, the Messiah, and then he goes on to say he's from, the, from um, Nazareth, he thinks that doesn't work. That can't be the case. He can't be the Christ. He can't be the Messiah. But he's willing, even though he doubts that Jesus really is who he is, he's willing to go and see him. But when he too sees Jesus, the word that became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. When he came in contact with Jesus, all doubt was gone. And Nathaniel followed Christ. And so just for a moment or two uh, this morning, I want us to consider that verse in the light of those three stories of John the Baptist, who was convinced from the beginning, from Philip, who listened to John and saw Jesus and was convinced to Nathaniel, who didn't really believe and thought it couldn't quite be possible because of his preconceived ideas of where Jesus was from. Actually then came, and when he saw Jesus for who he was, he believed. And for a moment or two, we'll have a look at this verse. And it's really interesting because this is one of the most exciting verses in the book. There's a man called Augustine. Augustine is, is one of the greatest theologians who ever lived. He's, he's called a, one of the early fathers. In other words, it was quite near the time uh, whenever Jesus uh, was, was about two, two, 250 years after Jesus uh, rose from the dead. And Augustine belonged to uh, a lovely Christian family. And as he grew up, he decided that he didn't want to believe any of it. And so he, he left his family and he got mucked up and messed up and lots of different things. 
And there, there's a book called The Confessions of St. Augustine. And some of the things he said he did were awful, awful things. And, uh, but he thought, I don't believe in God. I'm not interested in God. And, and I'll do my own thing. His father was concerned about the way he was living. And he said to him, look, would you not read this for me? And it was John's Gospel. And he gave him John's Gospel. And he came to John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And he says in his confession that when he read that, he realized, he realized who Jesus is. And at that point, he gave his life to the Lord. When he realized who Jesus is, there is only one response, Augustine said. And that response was to follow him, to live for him, and to be his son, to be his servant, to, for him to be my savior. And that's why he gave his life to the Lord. So a couple of wee things I wanted to look at in this verse. The first thing we notice is it uses a, a strange word, or we think is a strange word for, for living among us. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's not how we normally speak. And, and it's a wee bit awkward in the Greek too. It means he pitched his tent among us. Or it could mean like he, he tabernacled with us. Now, we definitely don't use that word now, nowadays. You don't hear people saying, would you like to tabernacle? along with us but that's that's really what it what it means it means that god the word that he explained in, in in john chapter 1 verse 1 that word that became flesh came and dwelt among us lived among us as one of us uh, it's the same picture we have of the old testament and i think that's maybe why john used this word because it's the same word that's used in hebrew this is the greek it's the same word that when it's translated from the hebrew that means tabernacle and of course that word is rich in meaning uh, for those who are jewish they would have fully understood what john meant by this that the word god himself became flesh and he tabernacled with us. Because if you remember, whenever they, they crossed uh, the, the Red Sea, and they had that sense, remember, uh, Miriam was dancing and singing, that that sense of victory. And that was the sense, and I, I didn't dance or sing last week, you'll be glad to that. But that was the sense going home last week that I had. I was, I was thinking of Miriam and thought, the sense of joy that God is good. I mean, this was started off a 1.3 million build. And most of us thought, my goodness, this will take us years to pay it off. And because of God's goodness, it's all over as far as paying the building is concerned. And, and for the people of Israel, for the last 400 and odd years, they were slaves in Egypt. And God called them out and they crossed the Red Sea and the Egyptians were destroyed. It was over. As far as they were concerned, that was the end of the old life. And here was a fresh start. And the sense that is for us, that we, we have paid the debt of the old building and the new building, and now we're ready to move on in a new ministry that, that, that complements what we have done in the past. And while that was happening, God gives instructions to build the tabernacle. The tabernacle itself is only 45 feet by 15 feet. Uh, and the instruction was that Wherever the people went, the tabernacle went with them. And there's a number of things. We're going to look at six different things regarding the tabernacle that is true of Jesus today. The first thing about the tabernacle is it was always in the center of Israel's camp. Wherever they went, the first thing they did whenever they, they went to a new place was to build the tabernacle again because it was a tent. It was a temporary, it wasn't, it wasn't a brick structure, it wasn't a stone structure, it was a, a wooden and cloth structure. And so it was meant to be moved along wherever the people went. And the very first thing, whenever they stopped to make camp, before building their own tents, they built the tabernacle. And the reason for that was it was important that once they built the tabernacle, that all their tents went around the tabernacle. The tabernacle had to be built first because it had to be the center of the people's existence and that's certainly true of christ 
He comes and he wants to be the center of our lives. He wants to be the very center of all that we do. And, and, and that's why I don't really, this is a personal thing, but I don't like churches being called tabernacle. You've got the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London and the Metropolitan Tabernacle here in Belfast. And, and just a personal thing, I, I, I don't think that's the right word because the tabernacle is, 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 is Christ in the center of the church. And of course, because we are the church, then Christ is not centered in this building. This is not the tabernacle. This is a church. And the difference is that the word church is the Greek means ecclesia, it means uh, to, to call out. And so we are the church, and therefore wherever we are, that's where the church is. And therefore the sense of tabernacle is, the tabernacle is in the center where, where, where God's church is, where we are. And so wherever we are, Christ is within us. He should be at the center of our lives and what we do in our church life. He should be the center of our life, what we do in our work life. He should be the center of our life, what we do in our family life. And he should be the center of our life, what we do in our fun life. He should always be at the center wherever we go. That's what happened with the tabernacle for 40 years. Wherever they moved, and they moved lots and lots in different places, the very first thing they did was build the tabernacle because it had to be at the center. And once that was built and centered, then all the other things could happen round about it. And that's what Christ should be in our lives. He should be the center of our lives. Not just our church lives, but in everything that we do. Because he made his dwelling among us. The second thing about the tabernacle that we notice in the Old Testament, it was a place where the law of Moses was preserved. It, it was built there in order that all the sacrificial system might, might work there that all their offerings might be done there, and, and all that they were to do could be done at the tabernacle. It wasn't until later on when Solomon built the temple, and that was a debate whether he should have or not, but that, that's for another morning. But the tabernacle was where the, the, the law was to be observed and preserved. And we know that that's what Jesus, that's why Jesus came. Jesus came that the law of Moses might be fulfilled. That's why it talks about later on when he says, are, are, are you a prophet? Are you Elijah? Have you come to fulfill uh, Moses' law? And, and he tells them, no, the Messiah is coming. The one who comes after me is greater than me. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And then when he sees Jesus, what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In other words, he is the one who is preserving and preserving the law. It's because Jesus died for us that we have our sins forgiven. And therefore, we know that our sins are forgiven. And we know that we have fulfilled the law and every requirement of the law because Jesus did it for us. And so when we think of the fact that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, we remember the fact that Jesus died for us. And all of the law is fulfilled in us. And so whenever people try to tell you that you need to be a Christian and do these other things, nonsense. Uh, I was doing a small Bible study with a couple of men during the week. And we're looking at Galatians. And I was saying that Galatians is all about the Galatians who believe the gospel. And whenever Paul goes to somewhere else, others come in and say, you know, you Galatians, you're really good at believing the gospel. But you miss something else. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow all the feasts and festivals. Because if you don't do that, you're really not a Christian. And so all the Galatian Christians thought, okay, then we'll be circumcised and we'll start to follow the law as well. Paul hears about it and flips his lid. He writes to them and says, are you idiots? Are you foolish? What are you at? Why are you turning from the real gospel to a gospel that's not the gospel at all? And he's really cross with them. Because what they've done is they've taken the gospel and they've tried to add things to it. As Christians, we are saved. As Christians, our sins are forgiven. As Christians, we have fulfilled the law to the letter because Jesus has done it for us. That's the second thing when we look at the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And not only should Christ be the center of our lives, but he has fulfilled the law totally for you and for me. That's why this verse is a wonderful verse. The third thing about the tabernacle is it was seen very clearly as the dwelling of God. This is where God dwelt. Uh, without a, 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 an iota of misunderstanding, every single person, from the youngest to the oldest in Israel, would have understood 
that's where God dwells. Because within the tabernacle, 45 feet by 15 feet, there was a section, a third of that, was called the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was the, the Ark of the Covenant. And within the Ark of the Covenant was, or above the Ark of the Covenant, was the Shekinah glory. God's glory, shining glory. And that's where God dwelt. And it reminds us that in Christ, as, as Colossian tells us, that God dwells completely in him. And that's really what this verse is saying exactly. It seems when people say, well, I'm not sure if Jesus is God, they're not reading the Bible. Because as the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of Jesus is the glory of the Father. And so therefore, when we believe in Jesus, we believe in God. When we say that Jesus lives within us, God lives within us. And that's why we know that our salvation is full and is free. The fourth thing about uh, this tabernacle, it was a place of revelation. It was a place where God spoke to the people and he spoke to them words of blessing, but at times he spoke words of condemnation. And in Christ, that's why it's important that we read the Bible and that's why it's important we hear what Jesus says because when he speaks, he's speaking words of revelation from God. And therefore, he tells us great things about heaven, tells us great things about God. He tells us terrible things about us. But he also tells us wonderful things about us. And so therefore, when Jesus speaks, it's the words of truth. He is revealing to us God himself. And so therefore, it's good when we take good advice from, from lots of good people. But sometimes good advice from good people might not suit us. But it's, also, it's always very, very necessary that we hear what Jesus says and does do what Jesus tells us to do. And the reason for that is because he reveals to us God's heart, because he himself is God. And therefore, it's not this or that. It's not, well, I might believe Jesus one day, or I might follow him one day. When Jesus speaks, when he says, this is the day of salvation, when Jesus speaks and says, now is the time to follow me. So when he talks to, to Philip and he says, follow me, Philip doesn't. Because Philip recognizes that he is revealing to him God himself. When Nathaniel hears it, he says, mm, I'm not sure about it. Um, Jesus of Nazareth doesn't sound too good. But when he sees Jesus, He's convinced. And each one of us need to hear the call of Christ. And people say, well, I don't know really what a Christian is, or I don't really know how to become a Christian, and I don't really know if it's for me. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says that the salvation is for everyone. Uh, the offers of salvation is for everyone. So Jesus is offering each one of us salvation. And he also tells us that salvation is necessary. Because without salvation, we will be eternally damned forever and ever and ever. And so therefore, there's no misunderstanding. Salvation is for all of us. And salvation is for all of us to accept now. And because we have no guarantee of tomorrow or next week. The first thing about this tabernacle that we hear is, it's a place where sacrifices were made. As I say, that's where all the sacrificial system took place. And we know that's Jesus. That's why um, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, because Jesus is the one who paid the sacrifice for you and for me, the perfect sacrifice. That's all that it takes. And these people who came into the church at Galatia, they were saying, you know, Jesus did a really good job to start the ball rolling, but this is the things that you have to do. That's absolute nonsense. We don't have to do anything to be saved other than trust Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. He has paid the price, and the price, the price is paid in full. And the sixth and final thing about this is it was where the people of Israel worshipped. In other words, where the tabernacle was, that's where their centre of worship is. And therefore, going back to point number one, Jesus needs to be the centre of our lives so that we come and worship him all of the time. And it's good that we come here in the morning, and it'll be great to see you here again tonight. But our worship isn't contained to a morning service and an evening service. But our worship for Christ should be all week long. I was doing a funeral during the week, and I've got to know uh, the funeral directors really well. 
And the first thing they said to me was, uh, well, what the, the, the driver of the, the hearse. Good to see you, Danny. He says, uh, see when the weather's good like this, I wish I had your job. I said, Robert, what do you mean? He says, two hours a week, one hour in the morning, the Sunday morning, I was in it. that's the job for me. And he says it every time. And one of these days I'm going to say, listen, come on, we'll go out the back. I want to show you something. And I'll give him a good digging. And then he'll say, that minister gave me a digging. And I said, oh, of course. I Would a minister give somebody a digging? You see, and then you're my witnesses. That wouldn't do such a thing. And, uh, but people joke at that all the time. Oh, minister, that's a great job, two hours a week. And they used to do that in Market Hill. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll preach for an hour and a half on Sunday mornings so that you can get your money's worth. They were never keen on that for some reason. And... Uh, but being a Christian isn't two hours a week. Being a minister isn't two hours a week. Being a follower of Jesus is all of the time. And therefore we worship Christ, not just in what we do here on a Sunday morning, but as we do the dishes, as we do the shopping, as we help a neighbor, as we do the gardening, as we work at our jobs, whatever we might do, we worship him and who we are, because that's what he calls us to do. And very finally, we've run out of time, but. The three things that we see in Jesus is God's glory, God's grace, and God's truth. And that is shown time and time again in the whole of John's gospel. And it should be shown in your life and my life. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for who Jesus is. And we thank you for this wonderful verse, John chapter 1, verse 14. And sometimes, Lord, we, we read it so often and we've known it for so many years that we take it for granted. We don't think about it. We don't marvel at how wonderful verse it is. It's like when we see a building from childhood and we don't think it's a big deal. And when we hear tourists talk about it, we think, are they looking at the same building I'm looking at? But they can see the wonder because they've never seen it before. Help us as we read your word through your spirit that it's as if we've never seen it before and we marvel at how wonderful you are and what you have done for us and what we can become in you, that we can be transformed from being children of wrath, dead in our sins, slave to self and to sin, to being free, alive and full of grace. Speak to us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord with our offerings. to be talented isn't it we're going to sing it again it's a lovely old hymn it's uh, when peace like a river it reminds us that when god is on our side even though we go through we go through difficulties and trials we can honestly say it is well with my soul 
And it's not because we don't see reality. Of course we see reality. But it's because we really see reality. Because when we see reality in Christ, we recognize that amidst our trouble, God lives within us. Let's stand as we worship. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>